Sometimes they're going to give you products of a reaction and ask you to figure out what were the reactants that came together to make that. So what I'm talking about is the reverse aldol. So let's say they wanted to know what were the two pieces that came together to make, say, this four-membered ring here. Yeah. Let's say they asked you what were the what was the reactant that came together to make this in the presence of OH minus and heat. So again. First, you should be able to recognize that this is the product of an aldol condensation. Why? Because if you do that numbering trick, you say the carbonyl is carbon 1, and then you count 2, 3 away, a double bond is between 2 and 3. So I know this is the product of an aldol condensation. Now, we saw before that what heat did was it made the double bond, which means going backwards one step, if I just look at that heat for a second, I know that there was an OH on carbon 3. Because we said, the way the condensation works is when you have heat, your base pulls off a proton here and swings down to make a double bond between 2 and 3. The OH was originally on carbon 3. We also saw in that previous example that the bond that we formed, the bond that we made that connected the two carbons to each other, was between carbon 2 and 3. right? Because what we did was we had an enolate, an enolate plus minus, 1, 2, attacking a carbonyl on carbon 3. And so this swung down, this swung down and this attack there and this swung up, and you had double bond O, O minus, which became an OH. But notice, 1, 2, 3. So the bond we make in aldol reactions is between that 2 and 3 carbon. That said, if I want to go backwards, all I have to do is erase the bond between 2 and 3 and turn the OH back into a C double bond O. So this would have been the reactant that came together to make that. Now, arguably, actually no, I'm not gonna say that. No, that's perfect. Right, so this is how you can do a reverse aldol without worrying about any mechanisms. How can you figure out what the reactant was? Find the bond between two and three, erase that bond. Put a double bond O back on carbon 3, and you're done. Okay. Now what about the actual mechanism of a, rever of a reverse aldol? Well, one thing I've been stressing a lot, if you've worked with me, is the fact that every intermediate in these reactions that we like to deal with ends up being the same going forwards or backwards. So let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4. I think I drew an extra carbon, didn't I? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I have five carbons now. Did I have an extra carbon in what I drew before? I might have. Well, this carbon now should be here. That's my mistake. There we go. Right, because we had one, two, three, four. Yeah, that should be right. Okay. So. We said this was the reactant that we used to make this ring right here. Okay? And we need to show the mechanism that turns this back into this if we're doing what's called a retro aldol. So, retro meaning reverse. So, we know the first step was an OH got removed by heat. So, in this case, an OH is going to be added if we're going backwards. So first step, bring in an OH minus. And we know where that OH minus should be attached. It's going to come and attack there. Now, obviously, this carbon has four bonds, right? There's a hydrogen that we didn't draw in, but there's a hydrogen there, which means we have to move electrons. We're going to get this double bond to move. And we know the best, most stable place for a double bond is to resonate up into that oxygen. And so your first intermediate would look like this. OH on carbon 3, and we have this, this is a double bond, and an O minus. We have our enolate plus the other carbons. <coughs> now, okay. 
Now, one thing you have to remember about enolates is they're constantly doing what's called tautomerization. Enolates are constantly fluctuating between their enolate form and their carbonyl form, back to back, okay? Which means that's what's going to happen here. You can either write reverse arrows and then say tautomerize, or if you want to be perfectly accurate, have some source of a proton. Let's say water is floating around because we saw before water was floating around. And that O minus will swing down and the carbon on the end of that double bond will grab the proton. Tautomerizing this back into its ketone form, its carbonyl form, okay? And notice, this was the product we made of the aldol reaction before we did the condensation. And this is what we got after the condensation. So we're about halfway now. Now, we know that the reactant that made our ring was formed from two separate double bond O's. And we need this to form from two separate double bond O's, or we need to turn this back into two double bond O's. So what's going to happen is now, this oxygen is going to look to reform its carbon-oxygen double bond. Now, because we're in base conditions, I'd argue you're probably going to deprotonate that OH. And this is why I was saying, let's pretend earlier, that it didn't get deprotonated because that might have driven the reverse aldol. Either way, that OH- minus will come in and grab that proton. The electrons go up to the oxygen, and now you have an O-, minus which we saw before was another one of our intermediates, an O minus on carbon three, and our double bond O on carbon one. This being carbon one over here, two, and three. And now what can happen is this double bond O, or this single bond O minus will swing down, reforming its double bond, but now here we're making the carbon the leaving group. Why am I making the carbon the leaving group? Because this is a retro aldol reaction. In general, carbons are not leaving groups, but here again I'm saying, this is that one exception to that rule I made not too long ago. Because I know this is what I'm looking to make. I need to break the ring, which means I need to break a carbon-carbon bond. And here's the reason why this is acceptable. Because when these electrons swing down onto carbon-2, you have this, the double bond O. You've broken the ring now. Carbon-3 and 2 are separate. You have the double bond O here and you have a carbon with a negative charge. This negative charge is still stable. In other examples, a carbon with a negative charge is generally not stable, but this is stable because it is able to resonate with the carbonyl. So a better way to say it is you never wanna have carbons being leaving groups if that negative charge they get can't resonate. It can't resonate into something that's more, that makes that negative more stable, like an oxygen. <laughs> and we know that in this case it can, which gives us a resonance structure, double bond O, And this is now O minus anenolate. Now I'm going to redraw this a little neater over here so we can visualize it a bit better. We have one, two, three, one, two, three. We have this right now. Right? This is just redrawn over here, a little neater. And notice what we have again. We have an enolate. And just like what I said over here, is enolates are constantly tautomerizing back to their keto form, which means, once again, this enolate can tautomerize, swing down, this goes out and grabs a proton from another water molecule, and we get back to what we started with. So that's the general mechanism of a retroaldol, and what you'll notice is every single intermediate that I, I showed going backwards is the same as the intermediates formed when I went forward. If I went forward, I deprotonated here and made an enolate. Then I had this attack the carbonyl. Or actually, I didn't show the forward mechanism of this, but going forward, what would happen is this carbon would get deprotonated, and I have two alpha carbons, so why didn't I deprotonate this one? This one is pretty acidic, right? Well, in other examples, there won't be this nitpicky issue. I probably did. I didn't see this coming up with it on the spot, but if we were given the reactant, or if we were given the product, we know what we want to form. Another argument might be is if I deprotonated this, I couldn't really form a ring then because it's right in the middle, it can't attack there, it can't attack there, I wouldn't form the ring. Here I can still form that four-member ring. 
So I deprotonate, form the enolate. This enolate swings down and attacks the other carbonyl, making the ring and an O minus. That O minus grabs a proton to become an OH. And then you go through the, the condensation reaction where that OH is kicked off, forming a double bond between two and three. 